How's it guys, it's MJ and in this video what I want to do is talk about the environmental influences and specifically what you know the various main investor classes, um, how they interact with it. So I want to start off with households or private individuals and if we have time I'm going to go into the other ones um, being you know uh, financial intermediaries, corporate businesses, foreign investors and so forth. Um, but if I get time, otherwise I'll just make separate videos for them. So I'm looking at households. These are videos around the fellowship exam for finance. Um, remember, they're raw, they're unedited, they're unscripted. I'm going to be giving a lot of my opinion. So feel free to um, query what I say in the comment section below. But without further ado, let's get into, um, get into the material. And very much, I mean, we have the, the syllabus objective, which asks us to demonstrate knowledge of the influence from main investors classes over the commercial and economic environment. And I want to start off with households. Now, what are some qualities of households? Well, they're quite small in sense of their financial uh, influence. So small uh, financial influence but there are many of them. So they, they might be individually quite small, but they, there are many of them, yeah. And what's interesting is when you look at, at households or, or private individuals, I know this is one thing that we get drilled into um, while we're studying actuarial science, is to be careful when giving financial advice, specifically um, to your friends and family, because before you can tell someone, oh, what share to invest in or what to do with their money, you need to be a financial advisor. And the reason why you need to be a financial advisor is because you need to consider um, all the various factors that influence uh, someone and their financial position. Um, I mean, across all the, the investor classes, we're going to see that um, each category will vary with regards to, say, uh, time horizon. Are you investing for the short term or for the long term? Um, what is your appetite for risk? And I mean, you can also have a capacity for risk. And it's quite interesting that not often are these two uh, balanced. You might find someone is, is very eager to take on a risk, but might not actually have the capacity to take on risk. Or someone will have a large capacity for risk, but then be risk adverse. So it's quite interesting how those two aren't always in tangent. Um, also, the, the tax position is very important. Remember, I have made a, a whole video explaining why tax is stupid. Um, so go check out that video. But now, what we're going to also be looking at is, well, what this means is that some assets or some investments will be more risky to some uh, people and be less risky to other people. Because... When you look at, say, a household, let's maybe use a different color. Um, when you look at a household, there's, there's all these very different um, considerations that you need to make. So when a household co comes to, to make an investment, they're, you know, they're, they're focusing on um, what are their liabilities. You know, do they have some children? Do these children need an education? How old are the children? That's going to, you know, say how much many more years of education you need to be funding for. Uh, do you have a bond on your house? Um, all those type of things. So what are their, their current liabilities? Also, what is their liquidity position? Um, you know, do they have a lot of money on hand? Have they tied up all their money in, say, their house? What, what is their liquid position and how will that affect their, their choices? Um, also, uncertainty around future, um, future cash flows. So this could very much go down to what type of job they have. Do you have a very stable job where you're going in from 9 to 5, you're getting a very nice salary at the end of every month? Or are you more of, say, a consultant or an entrepreneur who gets a lot of money one month, no money in the next month, and you know cash flows are a little bit more uncertain? That's going to influence um, your, your decisions. Again, your tax position, what tax bracket you're in, um, how well you understand investments. So level of investment expertise. I know a lot of people will say 
finance, it's, it's way too complicated for me. I'm rather going to just give all my money to a financial intermediary, um, like an asset manager, and they can, they can look after it. They can invest for me because I actually don't know what's going on. I mean, and that's likely because the, the stock market and bonds and all these type of things are intimidating at first. Um, also, we also want to look at what is the stability of their current assets. So if someone has got all their money in, say, a house, um, how will that stability be to someone who's got all their, their money in, the, say, the stock market in very volatile shares? Um, another thing is the, the characteristics, so the investment and risk characteristics of uh, assets available. So what I mean by that is someone might want exposure to the property market but they might not be able to afford a brand new house or, or a part of a house, or there might not be any uh, financial um, instruments to give them you know, exposure to, to property. So we need to consider what assets are actually available before giving someone financial advice. And then um, what we've spoken about there, at appetite for risk can also be thought of as their attitude to risk. Because I mean, when you look at an individual, um, let's use another color. You've got an individual. That individual might have dependents, okay, little babies or little kids. Um, and these kids add a lot of uncertainty. Uh, they're a big liability as far as, you know, an education and, and all these various expenses that need to be made for them. Now, there's two things that, that people generally do. They either buy um, insurance products such as health insurance, life insurance, uh, and all those various things, and you know, save towards uh, education annuities and all that type of stuff, or they get uh, something known as like a nest egg, where they self-insure. So sometimes you see in the movies, people they you know they put a bunch of money in a jar, and then if anything bad happens, they use that nest egg to to pay off um, whatever um, bad event has happened. So depending on what they're doing or what their insurance products are and what their other assets are and their entire financial position, you need to consider that before you can give someone um, advice on what shares or something to buy. I mean, a lot of people um, have got a large proportion of their, their wealth in their own property. So some people, they will have a, say, a 5 million rand house and their total wealth will be, say, 7 million. And that means, I mean, a 5 million house versus 7 million total, a large proportion of that is in the property, which means if property prices go down, they lose a lot of their wealth. Also, property is not very liquid, so if there is a problem, they're in a little bit of a sticky situation. Um, Another interesting thing with regards to households and which the notes talks a bit about and I disagree with is it says that households desire diversification. Okay. And what the notes say, I mean, it makes a lot of reasonable sense, but it's not empirically backed. I mean, there's not actually enough evidence to support what the notes are saying. What the notes are saying is that Households want diversification because of the fact that they've got so much money in property. They do want to say diversify in shares and equity and bonds and all those other things. And diversification makes a lot of theoretical sense because it brings down the theoretical uncertainty, the theoretical volatility. So it is reasonable. But... It's not empirical. How do you spell empirical? Empirical. What do I mean by it's not empirical? Well, this leads to one of the biggest unsolved problems in finance, and that is something known as the equity home bias puzzle. So let me write it down here. The equity home bias puzzle. Okay. And what this equity home bias puzzle basically says is it says that the evidence contradicts the statement okay when they look at the populations of of the various uh, countries 
they see that people's investment habits tend to invest in their home country. Okay, so they find that say something like 90% of an individual's wealth is in their own country. And that's a little bit crazy. That that is, I mean, let's say South Africa. Let's let's talk about South Africa. Um, so yeah, South Africa. I know a lot of uh, friends and family. When they talk about diversification, they're thinking of, okay, I'll have my own property. I'll have shares in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and I'll maybe buy bonds um, that the South African government issues. And it's all local. Very few of them have any international assets, okay? And very few of them um, who do, they only put in a very small percentage. I think my brother puts a little bit, um, you know, he, he, cause he's got a master's in finance, so he's smart. You know, so he, he's diversified um, outside. But the majority of people, they tend to buy local assets, which is really weird because specifically in, say, a country like South Africa, um, and I mean, a lot of countries today, this, this risk is getting bigger, is the political risk. Okay, the political risk, um, you know, or say the, the currency, I mean, South African currency has been very volatile this year. And by having local assets, we are exposing ourselves to currency and political risk, and we're not diversifying that away, which is really weird. Why, why aren't we buying international shares? And this is something that we need to think about when we start considering the economic environment. And that is that even if things get really bad, it seems that the, the households are still going to buy local, um, local investments. Now, one of the, the questions or one of the, the proposed solutions to this is that they say that capital is immobile. And I know, again, that is something that happens in South Africa and maybe a few other countries also have it, is they have capital uh, flight restrictions, which means you cannot take out a certain amount of, of currency out of the country. Um, I think it's limited to a few million rands every year that you are not allowed to take out. So if you are a billionaire in South Africa, you make a billion uh, rand, you can't take all of it uh, to the Bahamas and set up a, you know, a lifestyle living on the beach there the government will prevent you from doing that. However, I mean, the capital restrictions, like I said, are, are quite high. I mean, I think it's, it's 2 million or 5 million, I don't know, somewhere around there. I mean, that's a lot of money. I mean, that means that every year you can take, um, you know, less than that and purchase, say, a little bit of equity in the American stock market, in the British stock market, in the Australian stock market, in the Japanese stock market. You know, we, we have the potential to do that, and especially, especially how advanced financial intermediaries are today. There, there are these products available, yet people don't seem to take them. And I mean, another interesting thing with capital immobility is when you start looking at things like Bitcoin and these various cryptocurrencies, which seem to provide a loophole or a way around leg, uh, legislation and regulation that prohibits capital flight. Because what you can do is buy a whole bunch of Bitcoin in your home country, um, fly to another country and exchange your Bitcoin for that local currency and you can move millions um, or even more uh, money this way. And this is why Bitcoin's value, I mean, seems to keep going up is we've seen this is happening a lot in China. People are using Bitcoin to get around the capital restrictions in that country. But at the end of the day, I mean, what we just need to remember is that households are, are a player in the economic environment. And though individually each person is, is small, there is a, a lot of them. And a lot of them, they can cause quite a lot of interesting things to happen. I mean, one of the big things is bubbles. So what happens here is it becomes, say, fashionable to invest in, say, private equity startups or something like that. And people, you know, herd mentality and all those various things, they want to get in on the action. And we might see a lot of people buying into these assets that overvalues them. So 
one way you can make money in the stock market or in the asset uh, world is if you have a good understanding of what households want. What are households buying and what is that doing to the price? Does that make the, let's say households all want government bonds. Let's say that's the flavor of the month. If you know that and you have the data that shows households are buying um, you know, an obscene amount of government bonds, then you know that the government bond value is going to be overpriced and that you should either short that bond or not enter it into a long position uh, and rather look at other assets. Because remember, households do not have the you know, investment expertise. There is a lot of irrational behavior um, behind them. And like I mentioned, there is this thing known as herd mentality. And yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, when you go into the whole household, um, what they're doing and what, what you know, assets they're enjoying and all that type of stuff. And I mean, one way you can find that out is by doing a survey. Although I know some people do get uncomfortable when disclosing what assets they have and what their investment habits are. But at the end of the day, what we're going to be seeing is that whoever has the most data um, can actually make money in the stock market. And the reason why data is so important is because sometimes the theory will say things like diversification is good, it's what households want, but the data, the empirical evidence, will suggest otherwise. And that may be open some opportunities, um, or it might you know, help you with managing your very own risk. But overall, I think that's what I want to talk to you guys about on households. Um, if I think of anything else, I will throw it down in the comment section below. But let me know what your thoughts are, and I'll see you next time when we're talking about financial intermediaries. I think, let me rather make a better video, uh, sorry, another video, so that this one is not too long. But yeah, otherwise guys, thanks so much for watching. Hit subscribe, I will be releasing these videos daily. So yeah, stay in contact. Cheers.